Thank you for coming. I'm Jamie Zionic, one of the co-chairs of Dairy and Feedback. Um, I'd like to, of course, as always, thank the um, Dairy and Library for their generosity in co-hosting uh, our events with us, and I'd like to thank the administration for coming, as always. Thank you. Um, Peter McAllister um, is a board-certified neurologist and director of the New England Center for Neurology and Headache, uh, where he sees adults and children. Um, he has clinical appointments at both Yale, and I always say this wrong. Quinnipiac? Quinnipiac. <laughs> um, he is going to be speaking with us tonight about um, his expertise, which is treating ADHD, mood disorders, anxiety, and also um, many other neurological ailments. So, hello. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to check. Is this on? Does it make a difference? No, 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 no. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. This is recording, so this is not amplification. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you all for coming out uh, on a kind of a cold night, but as we said, at least it's not sleeting or snowing or anything else, right? Um, so I am in a practice in Stanford, as Jamie said. Um, I see five-year-olds and up. I need to be able to have a conversation with the person. So if they're six months old, I tend to send them elsewhere. I've been doing it for about 25 years, um, boarded in neurology and psychiatry. So I'm in the, the trenches dealing with some of the things we're going to talk about. I also do a lot of clinical research and lecture like all over the place. I've been in Oslo, Australia, Dublin, and usually it's on things that are not this. Um, brain injury, concussion, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, some of the stuff that I've published on. Um, but I've known Jamie for a while, and when Jamie says, come out and give a talk, you have to come out and give a talk. <laughs> and I do this all day, so I figured, um, why not? I'll kind of tell you my spin on medicines and children and even some parents will bristle at that medicines and children thing and I think I want to make a case that at the right time in the right setting with the right practitioner with a good doctor parent doctor child relationship and you know what you're going after medicines actually can be very very helpful I'm gonna preface it too by saying medicines are the last thing I do so I don't want you to think that I just throw medicines at people. I had a child in today from New Canaan. The mom said he was 16. The mom said that when he was four years old, uh, he couldn't sit still, he was easily distracted, um, didn't really make good eye contact, was sent to a psychiatrist in New Canaan. And the woman immediately said the child has autism and the child needed to be medicated with Abilify, which is a potent antipsychotic. Uh, I couldn't imagine putting a four-year-old on that unless they were coming at the parents with a knife repeatedly. And I said, did he have anger outbursts or was there some real reason? He said, no, that's just what she said the disease requires. And that's not true at all. So she got better care ultimately, got him off of that medicine, and he was medicine-free right up until he needed something. And now he's on something, and I'll get back to that a little bit. So at our center, uh, which is right on High Ridge Road, if you're familiar with Stanford, um, I must tell you that I borrow your town every day because I live in Rowayton, so I go right up Mansfield and cut over, so thank you. And the people in Rowayton kind of come here to do shopping and go out to dinners and things, and then we go back to our enclave. Um, I see... ADHD, anxiety, depression, um, I see a higher spectrum of autism. Um, I see them when they're mixed with other things such as seizures, traumatic brain injury, um, you know, wheelchair bound from some neuromuscular disease, spinal cord injury, etc. So I see a lot of kids with this and since I've been doing this for 25 years I've seen them transition into adulthood. Um, I'll give you some perspective on that at the end, kind of what happens to little people when they grow up. They still have the condition, generally they tend to be better and I don't know if you've noticed that um, as your kids have grown up. So ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, I don't need to tell this crowd. It used to be confusing because we said, I would say that, ADHD, and a parent would say, well, no, my daughter has ADD, and that's different from ADHD. And it turns out after 1994, they said, the heck with it, we're going to call it all 
ADHD, and it comes in a few flavors, right? It comes in the inattentive type, the hyperactive type, and then there's always a mixed group. So it's always ADHD. Um, it's very common. About 1% of the world has ADHD. 1%. It's strongly genetic. In fact, um, it's rare when I don't have this situation. Two parents are sitting here, child's in the center. Uh, we're firming up the diagnosis or, or, and or deciding how we're going to establish a diagnosis. Uh, and I say, you know, even though it probably wasn't diagnosed back in the day, well, which one of you is kind of like that? And then usually, sheepishly, someone goes, yeah, I was kind of like that. Um, this child today, the mom said she was exactly like the child. Um, who actually wound up not having um, autism spectrum disorder, just had really significant ADHD and some anxiety. And she said, and my father had the same thing. So now we're going back two generations to the child's grandfather. So it's strongly genetic. Um, it's <clears throat> characterized, as you know, by the inattention, concentration difficulties, focus issues. It's usually on the things that the child perceives difficulties with anyway. So sometimes I hear, well, my son can't have focus difficulties because he can play video games all day. And that's because the brain is happy playing video games. It's not so happy doing math packet, right? So um, there's also, I can't think of a kid, there's some probably, I can't think of a child who doesn't have executive dysfunction along with ADHD. It's just hand and glove. It's peanut butter and jelly. So executive dysfunction, you think of the part of the brain that's the conductor telling the other parts of the brain what to do. And that is usually somewhat off in most kids and adults too who have ADHD. Now every kid with ADHD will be an adult with ADHD. But interestingly, 8 out of 10 kids will ultimately try some medicine to treat their condition, and yet less than 20%, it's the inverse, 20% of adults will decide either to start or to stay on medications they had when they were younger. So why? Because the brain grows up, right? So we develop a frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is sort of the policeman of the brain. It kind of can help knock down impulsivity. Uh, it makes, you know, the, the right decision in the right situation. Um, some of us have more developed frontal lobes than others. And it's very asynchronous as a kid grows up. There are some 13-year-olds who really are quite developed frontal lobe. And they seem to make, you know, very good decisions. And then there are some lughead 15-year-olds uh, who, when you see them and they're 30 and they're nice, normal people, you say, God, what a disastrous teenager this kid was. Oh, the frontal lobe developed, you know? So it's very asynchronous. And each kid is individual. Anxiety mixes with ADHD. So <clears throat> anxiety is comorbid with ADHD. So what does a comorbid medical condition mean? Comorbid means two conditions exist in the same individual at a greater rate than predicted by chance. So we can have multiple medical conditions. You can have a thyroid condition and carpal tunnel syndrome, but that's just a coincidence, all right? So they coexist in you, but they're not comorbid. So when you look at comorbid conditions, probably share a similar genetics, and we know that anxiety and ADHD likely share polygenetics, several genes that tie them together. Um, they share family history, so that's genetics going back a generation. And we also know that they play off each other. So when a child with ADHD can't get his or her homework done, can't get it in on time, knows that they're going to get in trouble when they show up in school, anxiety goes through the roof. That further impairs focus and processing, right? So one leads to the other. So if you have ADHD, you're much more likely to have anxiety than if you don't have ADHD. So that's a comorbid condition. Um, I think you had a whole talk on anxiety last one, right? So someone came from the Mind Center. Um, I find anxiety fascinating. I had another boy today who was at uh, Eagle Hill and went through a period where he had a specific phobia for fire alarms. 
He was worried that the fire alarm was going to go off. Whenever they had a fire drill, he would have a complete meltdown. He did a lot of self-stim stuff whenever he thought about fire alarms. Um, and he needed to be medicated. And the medication, and it doesn't always, but the medication worked wonderfully well for him. And after a couple of years of brain development and we did some CBT, we were able to take him off the medicines and he's no longer taking it. But think of anxiety as something that we all have uh, to variable degrees, driven a lot by stress. And it's not always a bad thing in small aliquots, right? So if you are anxious about not doing well on the test, well, you're going to study for the test, right? So a bit of anxiety and a bit of stress actually is quite useful. So a disorder is when that particular thing, that phenotypic expression, uh, is getting in your way. So there's generalized anxiety in which they just, their mind is racing, they've got worry brain, it impairs their sleep, they're worried about bad guys, they're worried about any and everything, um, can't sleep alone. There's social anxiety. I see a lot of that. Um, it's one of the main reasons why a kid may not want to go to school. It's not necessarily the work. It's just being around peers. It just makes their skin crawl. That's social anxiety. Specific phobias can be any number of things. Um, fire alarm was one example. Um, Obsessive compulsive disorder is sort of a variant of anxiety in which one obsesses about things and has compulsions to do things, repetitive things. Um, and cognitive behavioral therapy can work on that as well. Both of those conditions are increasing uh, and there's some speculation as to why. I think part of it is we're better at diagnosing, um, but part of it is also, I think, social media. As far as anxiety goes, um, and I only say this half-jokingly, it's tough down here in Lower Fairfield County, right? I mean, it's hard to be a kid anyway when you're trying to form your brain, your resting default mode network, the collection of neurons who tells you who you really are um, or deludes you to believe that there's a reality in there. It's really just neuron squirting, which is kind of odd and philosophical and existential to think about. but. Factor that in on Darien, which is a lovely town of very successful, very intelligent, very driven people who want very successful, very smart, very well-driven children uh, to excel at lacrosse and to do this and to do that. And boy, that's tough. And then you've got social media. Like, who are you to the world? And what if you're not perfect like everybody else is on TikTok or on Facebook or anything else. I mean, it's, I think it's tougher than generations ago. Uh, depression in children. Um, I see that. I had a boy who had um, passive suicidal ideation today. Uh, and in adolescence, it very much mirrors ad adults in that women have more depression than men. My wife thinks we do it to the women, uh, per <laughs> perhaps. But in, uh, in, in adolescence and teenagers, about 20%, 20% of girls will have depression and about 6 or 7% of boys. With anxiety, boy, I think a quarter to a third of school-age kids can fit a diagnosis of one of those anxiety disorders I talked about. That's a lot. And then ADHD, it varies um, depending on the studies you look at. It's about 9 to 11%. Um, it's rising. Uh, it's, and again, there's maybe a number of different factors. So what do you do when you have someone who's got more than one thing? I think I can treat anxiety pretty well. I think I've gotten pretty good at ADHD. I can treat depression. What if you have, and you see this all the time, Someone who's got anxiety and ADHD and maybe also has OCD and depression. What do you do with that kid who's a neurotypical kid versus that kid who's got some sort of special needs? So you factor in the things like a traumatic brain injury, epilepsy, ASD, autistic spectrum disorder. Um, you know, so that's where things become moving parts. In fact, one of the meds you might use to treat one of the conditions can worsen the other condition, right? Not always. Stimulants, it's funny, stimulants are the mainstay of treating ADHD. 
And when you have an anxious kid who's got ADHD, comorbid common conditions, if you put them on a stimulant, one of two things happens. Either their anxiety goes up or their anxiety goes down. And I've given up on trying to predict who. Um, if you put someone on a med and it works brilliantly for their ADHD, and now they're firing on all cylinders, they're able to sit in class, they're not getting yelled at anymore, they're turning in their assignments, anxiety just drifts right down. However, ADHD stimulants work on norepinephrine, which sounds like um, epinephrine or adrenaline, it's speed, and that can cause racing hearts and perpetuate anxiety. And it's hard to know. And I'm going to get back to how to make rational decisions on whether to use medicines at all, and then if so, um, you know, wh which ones. The diagnosis of these conditions can sometimes be difficult. Um, some conditions, multiple sclerosis is one, if I do an MRI and a spinal tap on a patient, I can tell with 100% certainty virtually whether she has MS or not. That's nice. Um, we don't have blood tests for these conditions, so they're made by carefully listening to the story, getting the birth history, getting the family history, examining the child, and then doing the ancillary tests, right? I think the most important one would be neurocognitive, neuropsychological testing, right? You're all familiar with neuropsych testing? Of course you are. This is CPAC, right? So a PhD, we have two in our practice, would spend about four hours, sometimes more, sometimes less. And the way I describe it to an older kid is I said, think of an IQ personality SAT test kind of all rolled up into one. And what we get out of that is a, an estimate of IQ, and that's a little controversial because there's, there's plenty of nuances to that. But we get an estimate of IQ, we get a sense of anxiety, we get a sense of executive function or dysfunction, we can have a pretty good sense of ADHD, we can get a good sense on an MMPI of depression and that sort of thing, and really get a sense of how the brain is wired. So I like using neuropsych testing, and, and most of the kids who were new to me and were trying to establish diagnoses, neurologists are very nerdy, we like data, so I recommend neuropsych testing. Um, and I think that it can be repeated now and then through the intervals of one's life. I think school-based testing is fine, and I know we've got school folks here, and I mean no insult or ill will at all, but sometimes the agenda of one party is a little different than the agenda of another party. They can be overlapping, but they're not exactly completely the same. So sometimes doing it outside the school system uh, can be helpful. Some cases that look like, for example, um, autism, turns out, may be caused by other things, and it's rare. But if I find uh, a large head circumference, if I find uh, uh, something odd about the kid's facial features, I say, who does he look like, mom or dad? And they say, well, he doesn't look like anyone, not even his siblings. Um, if they're floppy, if they've got low tone, if they've got certain marks on their skin, I may do a full workup that would look at genetics, um, blood and urine tests, an MRI of the brain. There are some things, um, uh, Angelman syndrome or happy puppet it's called, uh, uh, leukodystrophies in the brain. So there are some things that we look at. I had a kid about six months ago, a fascinating case, um, was brought in for possible ADHD anxiety, but really had some psychotic episodes as well. Had some staring spells when I held the hands out, had a tremor. Uh, and something was really quite wrong. And there was no family history. So with ADHD and anxiety and depression, there's almost always a family history. There was nobody. So we wound up doing a really thorough workup, and the kid had something called autoimmune encephalitis. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Uh, it was, a, it was a cool one, and uh, treated with something called intravenous immunoglobulin and some steroids for a little while, which did not tolerate very well, getting back to medicines. But um, so, by and large, the common things are common, but if there's atypical features, it deserves more of a workup. <laughs> All right. So now we're gonna talk about medicines, um, and we'll kind of start by big picture. So at our practice, 
uh, we have very much a biopsychosocial outlook and attitude towards a child and an adult, quite frankly. And that is, take a specific condition, migraine, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis in children, you know, ASD, ADHD, anxiety, depression, etc. There's a known biology, that's the bio of biopsychosocial, uh, and these are as real a medical condition as any other. I think it's absolutely ludicrous that we arbitrarily use the neck as our dividing point, don't we? So if you have a condition below the neck, we call that a medical condition, but if you have a condition in the brain, that's often labeled a psychiatric condition. And that just never really made sense to me. These conditions that I'm talking about are um, neurochemical, genetic, um, there's influences from outside, there are things that happened over the course of one's life. Trauma, for example, and PTSD alters brain function. But these are as real as any other medical condition and should be treated as such. And any stigma should be just kind of wiped away. So we think of the biology, but then the psychosocial part is we take in what's going on with the kid and what's going on with the family dynamics. And sometimes the treatment of anxiety isn't Prozac, it's family counseling, because dad has a anger management problem, or mom drinks too much and gets in fights, or whatever else, right? So we take all that in. When I'm looking to treat somebody, we always have to have a reason to treat, so we don't treat someone just because they have ADHD. It's a non-lethal condition. One will grow up with ADHD without me intervening. Um, we treat when it becomes a problem, right? We don't want a child to have difficulty in school, difficulty in peers, being ostracized, etc. Just like a kid with Tourette's or even motor tics, we don't treat those unless the kid's getting picked on and people are making fun of him or her, then we treat, right? So, first of all, we don't have to treat. When we treat, I always look at medicines last, as I said. So we start with lifestyle. What's going on with the kid that we can modify things a bit? When it comes, for example, to ADHD, um, the biggest difficulty, particularly in older kids, is sleep, right? So. Study done on college kids who were assessed with very brief neuropsych battery and did not have ADHD, and then they were forced to stay awake 24 hours, and they retested them with the same battery, and they all qualified for a diagnosis of ADHD. All right, so sleep is our, is our secret weapon, and again, because of social media, because of binge watching Netflix, because of video games, um, because you get back and it's 9.30 at night, you have to eat something and do two hours of homework. I mean, it's awful. And the amount of homework kids get, I could editorialize on that, but I'm not a big fan. Um, if a kid is not getting adequate sleep, it's going to make their situation worse by and large. Not always. There's a small group of kids and adults who can do well on a um, little bit of sleep. But the particularly most vulnerable, you would think the younger kids, I think the particularly most vulnerable group is not the older teenagers and not so much the youngers, it's that middle school to early high school. Because if you look at brain development at that point, it is going crazy. So in the spectrum of brain development moving like this, around 12, 13, little different in boys and girls, it takes off like this and then it levels off again in the upper teen years. So quite frankly, I think that a 13 and 14 year old needs more sleep than a nine year old. Um, think of the brain, sometimes just for the fun of it, if the parent and kids are sitting there, I'll say, guess which one of us in this room has the most brain cells? Do you know the answer? It's the kid by far, all right? So you think of a child's brain as an overgrown English garden. It's just chock full of vegetation, right? And as they get old, particularly in this middle school to early high school, think of it as being pruned back. So now we're cutting, we're establishing pathways, we're setting up neural networks, we're identifying this background resting who we are called the default mode network, and brain cells are being offed. But it's a good thing. We want those brain cells offed. We want to have um, functional pathways, brain cells that are doing what we want to do. 
And that pruning really happens in slow wave sleep, deep, restful, multi hour sleep. For the adults, I'll tell you the end of the spectrum of life. Have you heard of amyloid in the context of Alzheimer's disease? Bad plaque? We all make plaque in our brain, it gunks it up, and we all get rid of plaque by a process that our brain does. And um, that is done in deep, slow wave sleep. So significant insomnia is now emerging as a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So I think even the adults need to probably get more sleep. Um, in the turn of the last century, well, the 1900s, the average amount of sleep for an adult was 8.9 hours, and now it's like 6.7 hours. And I think we're taking a hit as a result um, with obesity and stress and other things. So make sure the kid's getting sleep. The second one is diet. Um, I will start by saying as a scientist and researcher, there's a lot of diets out there that claim things that may or may not be true. Uh, that said, you know, I'm a big fan of organic and healthy and all that, right? So I think that's the first thing. The kid today that I saw um, admittedly had uh, a SAD diet, SAD standing for Standard American Diet. And in a 15-year-old, that's Chick-fil-A and bacon, egg, and cheese and all that other stuff, right? Um, and I saw you were serving candy up here and I was just <laughs> aghast. Like, what are you doing to your brain? Um, when it comes to um, autism, um, you're all familiar with the low gluten and low casein, right? So that's out there. Um, I think it's compelling but not proved yet that by doing that diet, um, you're lowering glutamate, right? Have you all heard about this whole thing? So glutamate is an excitatory uh, uh, transmitter in the brain. And excitatory doesn't mean a good thing. Excitatory means bad stuff in someone with ASD. And decreasing glutamate, you would think just eliminating monosodium glutamate, MSG, but it's in a lot of stuff. We have a very high glutamate diet in the Western world, and getting the glutamate under control has been shown in very small, open-label, not controlled studies to um, increase socialization and improve behavior. The other cool one that I think the jury is way, way, way out on yet in the cases that we're talking about, anxiety, depression, ADHD, et cetera, um, would be a modified ketogenic diet. Now, neurologists use ketogenic diet in refractory epilepsy, and it's proven. We also use it in our children with brain tumors because um, brains tumors do well when you feed it sugar and uh, they don't grow as fast if you feed it healthy fats. So the idea maybe of a modified healthy fats, protein, and then very low carbs on the back end may or may not turn out to be a good idea. It was just written up in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the really esteemed journals. They're not fatty at um, the New England Journal. So exercise, right? Um, it's been shown to help anxiety in teenagers. Uh, I think it helps a lot of other things as well. And um, teaching the kid mindfulness, meditation, we're big on that. We use biofeedback at our center all the time, which is different from neurofeedback. If you have a question later, I'll be happy to go into that. Um, you know, so those are all the things we do before meds. What else do we do before meds? Um, we can try having them see our speech or occupational therapists or our psychologists. Um, we teach for anxiety, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and I think you guys are all experts on that now, right? I think probably the last guy spoke about CBT. So, it's got the best data, and it, and it can work. I've also seen it fail, and that's okay, because nothing, medicine or non-medicine, not everything works all the time in a particular individual, right? When we have studies, we can show two-thirds did this well, and a third did this well, et cetera. But the, it keeps going back to the individual, what we call N of one experiments. That's your child, and the medicine we use in your kid, and that's our experiment. So then we say to ourselves, is the child doing wonderfully and succeeding the way we would like him or her to? And if the answer is yes, with all those interventions, no meds. But if not, 
than we talk about meds. And I've got a spectrum, just like there's probably a spectrum in this audience, of parents who say the moment they see me, get my kid on something right away, I don't care what it is, they need to be medicated. And I have the other spectrum where parents will say, do everything you can, but I'm anti-medicine. I don't want them on anything. And I've learned to work within those. Um, if someone really doesn't want medicines, we can do a lot of good things that don't involve meds. But I tend to make a case without forcing anything on them that if you go at it with your eyes open, if you have a practitioner that you trust, if you have open lines of communication, all my patients get my email, patients, the moms usually or the dads. Um, so if there's a little something that raises a red flag with the parent, shoot me an email, I shoot you an answer. If you have that sort of thing, and the other leap of faith you take from the doctor, but you can certainly Google because we all Google these days, is I need to assure you the medicine's safe. And we can talk about that, but by and large, the medicines that I prescribe are really, really safe. So then what happens is, you get four boxes. Just simply four boxes. The medicine we're gonna put the child on either works or it doesn't, or it bugs them or it doesn't. That's it. If the medicine works well and doesn't bug them, we have a hit on our hands and the child is doing better as a result of the medicine. If it works and is a little side effect, I generally tell the patient and the parent, hang in there, these tend to go away with time. Obviously, if it doesn't work, or there's a big side effect, if a kid throws up from the medicine or gets a rash or something, well, okay, then we move on. We don't abandon the whole idea. We move on to something else. We should also have, when we start a medicine, we should have an exit strategy. So you don't need medicines forever in kids. Their brains grow and mature. Um, sometimes it's a very specific time period. The parents are divorcing and the anxiety that was under reasonable control with CBT, exercise, and sleep hygiene has now gone through the roof. Well, you intervene and then you give it time and then you take them off the medicine. Um, people who are wired for anxiety and depression don't necessarily have to stay on a med the rest of their lives. If someone asks me, Doc, will I be on this medicine forever? I say, the good news is you're not going to live forever, so don't worry about that. Um, but generally, with one exception, you can be on a med for a while and then feel better, talk to your practitioner, have the dose, quarter the dose, get off the medicine. And let's say four or five years later, something else came up in your life, everything flared up, you go back on it again. And you're on it for a year or two and you go back off. And so over the course of 30 or 40 years, instead of being on a medicine for 40 years, you've jumped on and off at points that were necessary and you made the most of the medicine at that time. Does that make sense? All right. So the medicines that we use most commonly in the things that I just talked about. Um, so with ADHD, the literature in medicine now um, overwhelmingly supports the stimulants as being the most effective. And they work the fastest. So there's the amphetamine class and there's the methylphenidate class. The amphetamine class is you know, Adderall, Vyvanse, Quilivant, you've heard of these meds. The methylphenidate class is Ritalin, Focalin, Concerta. They work similarly on brain transmitters, but there's a little bit of nuances. It's like Dunkin' Donuts coffee and Starbucks coffee. And you know, some people are just, it has to be Starbucks, right? They're close, but there are some kids who you put on the amphetamine class and they don't do well. And you switch them over to the methylphenidate class and they do really well. So again, that's one of those things where you have to be in touch with the practitioner, observe your child, talk to your child, etc. The downsides of these medicines. So stimulants are really, really safe. They're safer than Tylenol, if you look at morbidity, that is dying. Why are they a scheduled drug, right? So you're all familiar with what a scheduled drug is? Most drugs are not scheduled, but the ones that can be habit-forming or dangerous or abusable get a schedule and it goes from two, three, four, and five. We can't do ones, we can't write those. That's like heroin uh, and LSD. The twos are the most 
um, dangerous, quote unquote, and they, by and large, that's your narcotics. That's Oxycontin and Vicodin and all those. Well, interestingly and historically, I'll tell you why, the stimulants are up there as class two really restricted drugs, meaning you can't phone it in, you can't give refills, you guys have to show your ID probably when you go to Grebes or to CVS. The reason is, historically, the FDA said, well, these drugs are fine when you take one or two, but if you take 30 and you grind them up and you snort them, it's like cocaine. And there have been kids who did that because what are we giving it to? We're giving it to teenagers. Weren't we all idiots when we were teenagers? So they can do stupid things. And there were some tragedies, there were deaths. So that's why it's considered a class two drug. But understand, as someone who's used them in many, many patients for many years, um, no one's ever had a significant difficulty from them. What is the baggage of stimulants? Two things mostly, and one and then a very rare one. The two things mostly you know. Appetite suppression is the biggest. And it's a real problem sometimes, particularly when you got a skinny kid. Um, the older kids, we kind of get them to sign a pact saying, I understand that to stay on this medicine, I am going to eat even when I'm not hungry and maintain body weight. Um, it's hard. So that's the biggie. The second one is interference with sleep. The drugs, usually these long-acting ones, last 7 to 12 or 14 hours. They wear out of you. So you should go to bed at night and you'd be able to sleep. But some people are slow metabolizers of it. There's still a bit of it hanging around at 8 or 9 or 10 at night, and it keeps them up. Those are your two big side effects. I throw a little melatonin in if a kid is having a mild sleep disorder. Um, but we rethink things if the kid has become an insomniac. Anxiety, we mentioned, can be increased in the face of stimulants, but it can also be decreased. I think most likely, most often, it's decreased. And then one in 770 kids um, has a psychotic episode on stimulants. It never recurs when you take them off. That's pretty new information, actually. Um, I don't think I've personally seen one, and I've taken care of many, many times 770, but it's listed out there. All right, so that's the stimulants. What else do we use for ADHD? Um, I probably next go to uh, Intuniv, Gronfacine. Are you familiar with that drug? It's, a, it, it's an oddball. It's an anti-high blood pressure drug in a class called alpha blockers. Its cousin is called clonidine. It's another blood pressure pill. It causes weight gain and sedation. So here's a concept that again, we try to, A, not put kids on meds until we need to, and then when we do, we like to keep it at one drug. But here's an example that sometimes we use what I like to call rational polypharmacy. If a stimulant is working wonderfully, except the kid can't eat or sleep, you put a little intuitive on at night, it's a bit sedating, helps with sleep, and it increases their appetite. Now you could say, well, you're just using one drug to take care of the side effects of another drug. And I am, but it's also approved to treat ADHD. We can often lower the stimulant when I've got both. So one of the, the principles of psychoneuropharmacology is sometimes two moderate or lower doses of a med, it, it works better and is better tolerated than one big dose. So something to think about. Uh, lastly, there's a medicine called Stratera. Or, Atomoxapine. Stratera was designed um, as an anti-anxiety, antidepressant drug. If you're familiar with, is all, everyone heard the term SSRIs, Prozac and all? The cousin is called an SNRI, that's Cymbalta and Effexor. Atomoxapine, Stratera, is an SNRI. Turned out it wasn't a very good, or it was good, but it wasn't a very powerful anti-anxiety drug. But in a model of um, ADHD, it seemed to work. So it got FDA approval. It's been around a while now. Multiple doses. Uh, it's usually very well tolerated. Nausea is a side effect. Night sweats, occasionally some weight gain. Um, my take on it, and when it works, it's terrific. But A, it takes like six weeks to even know it's going to work. And B, it's just not all that potent. So if someone cannot take a stimulant, 
and has failed the methylphenidate and the amphetamine classes, and we've tried various things. Um, I will go to that, and I will get some success some of the time. Um, so that's, that's what we've got. So the anti-anxiety treatment, as you know, CBT, non-medicine is the hallmark working with the parents. Remember, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And just like I talked about ADHD, and I said, all right, which one of you is like that to the parents? Um, most kids who are, have an anxiety disorder have a parent who either is anxious or has an anxiety disorder. So I have to factor that in when I'm treating the patient and I'm mentioning a medicine to a parent who's already anxious. And they say, whoa, wait a second here. That sounds awfully blah, blah, blah. And that's okay. I mean, I can, I can work through that. They say, how do you know this drug, Lexapro, uh, sertraline, et cetera, how do you know that's right for my child? And the answer is I don't, except since the 80s, we've got a database that's one of the biggest in the world of any single pharmaceutical attesting to the safety over generations of this drug. Um, and I say, we wing it. Because you know, to be perfectly honest, medicine is part science, it's part art, it's part guesswork. We are trying to get a little better at identifying who would respond to what medicine by taking a little swab inside the mouth and sending it to a lab. There's several, the one I like to use is called GeneSight. And GeneSight will tell you how you metabolize these drugs. And just like there's different heights and eye color, et cetera, we break down drugs differently. So for you, Lexapro might be fantastic, and for you, Lexapro might be in the bad category because you barely break it down and you're gonna feel kind of toxic on it, right? Now the thing is, some parents say, give me the gene site, I want it, and use it as an absolute Bible. It's not, it's a very rough roadmap, and we're still working things out. So every now and then, I am like the fifth or sixth doctor, and the parent comes in with the list, and there's one in the bad column, don't use this on the kid. And I say, well, you've tried all these, let's use this one. And they say, oh, you can't, it's in the bad category on the gene site test. And I say, I know that. Let's try a little tiny dose. And it often works, but no one else has tried it because it's in the bad column. So we use it as a rough map, it's not fully been worked out yet, but if you wanna ask your doctors, I wanna try that gene site, you'll get a nice printout of ADHD, anti-anxiety, antidepressant, antipsychotics, narcotic pain medications, and how the individual metabolizes them. Pretty handy. Um, my go-tos for social anxiety tend to be sertraline or Zoloft. I think there's good literature on that. My go-to for OCD tends to be fluoxamine, which is Luvox. Again, I do clinical studies. A clinical study proved its efficacy compared to a placebo, right? Take a thousand kids across the country, have a condition, say OCD, give half of them Luvox, half of them a sugar pill. It's blinded so that the kid doesn't know what he's taking. I don't know what he's taking. And at the end of three months, six months, however long the study is, statisticians break the blind. And what you want to see is your drug works this well, but guess how well the placebo works? That well. And it's amazing. I mean, I wish we knew how to use placebo. We wouldn't need medicines. What happens is, though, the placebo, because we can all be reasonably faked. Normal people want to get better. You give them a pill, even bigger placebo. You give them a shot of something, and they'll feel better for a while. The placebo usually wears off. But the placebo is profound. I was the principal investigator that got Botox approved for the treatment of chronic migraine. 15 headache days a month, 30 headache days a month. And one of the studies we did was not double blind, but single blinded, because you want to see who was going to be a placebo responder. So I injected uh, people with migraine with water. And they didn't know. They were told that there was a chance it was Botox and a chance that it was water. And they signed a consent saying, that's okay with me. Well, everybody got water. And just to show you about the placebo effect, patients would come back to me and a lot of them would say, my God, my migraines are so much better. I can't believe this. And the other thing they said is, everyone at work thinks I look 10 years younger. <laughs> so they were having a placebo cosmetic effect. Now, adults have a placebo response. Children have a placebo response on speed. 
So it's really hard to do research on kids because for a while, and a while is usually three months or so, almost anything you give a kid will improve things. And that makes it hard for the clinician because I put someone on something and a mom says, oh, he's doing really well on this, and then it all crashes. And I wonder if something happened or was he just a placebo responder earlier and now it's nosedived. So these are the things you think about. Um, for depression, we use the same drugs as anti-anxiety. Depression is the one that I, I, I take all of this quite seriously. Depression is the only one that can be lethal, right? You don't die of ADHD, but you can die if you kill yourself. Um, depression kind of can come in two major categories. The more common one is people who are down, who feel hopeless, who feel they don't have, they don't want to go out and socialize, etc. but they're not frankly suicidal. That's the most common group. Then there's a group who is actively suicidal and the only reason they're still on the planet is because they're on medicines that stop them from doing it and have you know, psychological intervention. Those people probably need to be parked on a med and not taken off it. But the rest of the world, um, as their depression changes, lightens, because it is, it kind of goes like this over the course of one's life. Um, if you have bipolar disorder, the antidepressant medications can not only not work, they make it worse. So if you put somebody who's got bipolar, one or two, on an SSRI, or worse yet, an SNRI like Cymbalta, um, it can worsen their depression and induce their mania. So it is important to, and there are children who have bipolar disorder. I've, I take care of a bunch. Um, we use medicines that are mood stabilizers in that group. Uh, Lamotrigine or Lamictal is the most common and it's a reasonably benign, its big thing is one in 200 kids can get a real head to toe rash. Uh, it can be pretty bad. So that's one, unlike the other ones who I kept saying safe, safe, Lamotrigine is one that I really think about and discuss with parents before I put them on it. And then there's the antipsychotics. So just like this boy I told you in the beginning when he was four years old, somebody put him on Abilify, a potent antipsychotic drug. We sometimes use them in significant depression anxiety and we sometimes use them in autism spectrum disorder. Uh, why? It's when the outbursts, behavior, um, violence to self and others uh, gets to the point where an intervention is necessary. And that's the only time I would use it. You know the only drug approved for autism? Anyone know? Risperdal. So Risperdal is an antipsychotic that's been shown to decrease some of that stuff that I just mentioned. Um, we'll be starting a study actually in June on an analog of something called oxytocin. So you may know oxytocin as like the friend hormone, right? So, so when you're first dating, it's not oxytocin, that's dopamine. That's like cocaine. I mean, so you're dating and it's exciting. Then you're shacked up or you're married or something and later the hormone mostly when you get together is oxytocin. It's friend, that type of thing, socialization. Um, we hope that still there's a bit of dopamine hanging around, but you know. <laughs> so oxytocin is important for social cues and socialization and eye contact and things like that. So we're, we're gonna look at a study. There's a drug that made it through a phase two study which is similar. It works on something called vasopressin. It'll be a nasal spray. So there is some interesting stuff coming out to treat that condition. And the cool thing is, as we're really sorting out the genome and we're getting a better sense of psychoneuropharmacology, um, there's some really neat stuff coming down the pike. So it may be in 10 years we'll look back and say, oh, how primitive we were in 2020. I hope so, because, you know, we're doing fancy stuff on other disease states with monoclonal antibodies, um, highly successfully, stem cells successfully stimulators in the brain and other parts of the body reasonably successfully. So I'm going to kind of stop now. This is how I approach treatment of some of these conditions we talked about. Um, it's, it's deliberative, it's measured, it's, only, it's hopefully well thought out. It involves parent buy-in, of course, because these kids are under 18. But I think that um, I have to be a bit of a salesperson and of course, I'm not wedded to any one drug, right? It's whatever is right at the time. But I have to close the deal with the parent. I have to convince them that I think this might be a good idea and why. 
what we're looking to accomplish, what the side effects are, and how we'll handle them if they come up. And I think if you do that, and you've got good back and forth with your clinician, um, medicines can be useful. What I see too often in, in pediatrics is underdosing. Little people, we start with little doses, but the other thing I say sometimes when there's a group of us in my office is uh, the parent will say, well, you know, can't, this has to go through their liver, et cetera. And I say, yes, of the three of us in this room, who do you think's got the healthiest liver? It's the kid. Now, often, kids' metabolisms is such that they burn through drugs. And I will see sometimes, someone comes to me and parent says, this drug, sertraline, uh, isn't working at all and I look at the dose and it's 25 milligrams, let's say in a 12 year old, and I say, you know, 25 milligrams, that's, that, has he ever gone up on that dose? That's a starter dose. And they say, no, the doctor said that is the dose for them. I have 12 year olds on 200 milligrams, and before you kind of gasp, if you're gonna use a drug, find the lowest effective dose. And effective is the key word. Why waste your time putting a kid on a medicine if it's not doing what you want? So those are some of the, the kind of rules of the road. So I think we're passing out cards. I'm happy to take hand questions, but we've also got the cards. Feel free to write things down, and we'll spend the rest of the time talking about that. Yes? Um, I've heard that with uh, stimulants and or with stimulants for ADHD, that there's often like a plateau effect. If they've been on something for a long time, it might lose its efficacy, and then they have to change it. Like, is that, yeah. is that common? Or? No, I don't think it's common. I do think that it's... A bit of urban legend and a bit of truth. Um, there's no, no study ever showed that. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but no study was ever able to show that. It might be a dose in here. It might be a dose. You know, kids do grow, and on a milligram per kilogram basis, you sometimes have to follow it along. But I do have some kids that are reasonable, and the parents are reasonable, and they can say, this particular drug has lost its mojo. I mean, I've heard that. I'll try a different class. But, so I don't think it's as common as maybe the lay person might think it is. Yes? Do you trust if there's any danger or benefit um, if a child's on stimulant for ADHD Monday through Friday and the family decides that the child is going to take them on the weekends? Yeah, so uh, did everyone hear that? So this is common. The stimulant drugs are one of the few, in fact, I think the only that I prescribe that it can be kind of an on-off thing. And that's very not the case for anti-anxiety, antidepressant drugs, and a lot of other drugs I prescribe. You can't stop your seizure drugs. Um, but certainly, there's, there's two schools of thought, and I think it's evolved over the 25 years I've been doing it. It used to be always, every break, every summer, weekends, kid was off the med. Then I'm fine with that. It, it's individualized. The, uh, sometimes it's more of a behavior issue with ADHD off the meds. And uh, the parents will say to me, I just can't take him when he's not on his meds. Or he's a disaster at the family gatherings when we go away on Thanksgiving. Um, in that case, a case can be made to keep him on. If a kid is having a very chill summer, hanging out at the pool, etc., you don't need a stimulant. But if a kid is going to robotics camp or something, then he needs a stimulant, right? But I'm perfectly fine with coming off on weekends and holidays and things. Yes. Are there benefits to doing that? Well, so yeah, appetite goes up. So this one mother really didn't want her kid off it because he was just, you know, bouncing around the house, annoying the other sibs. But, he said, but she said, when I take him off on the weekends or breaks, he'll at least eat like crazy. So that's one, and I think that's probably the biggest. Um, there was a 20-year study looking at, was there any downs, downside long-term for a kid being on a stimulant? And I think we were reassured that there was no big signal of anything. Kids weren't getting cancer and everything else. But it turned out that they probably wound up being compared to kids not on stimulants, somewhere between, I believe it was an eighth and a quarter inch shorter than their predicted height would have been, which is probably a function of not eating enough. Um, now, if mom is 5'9 and dad is 6'4, who cares? But if mom is five feet tall and dad's 5'4, that kid needs every eighth of an inch. Um, so I, I do discuss that uh, in my 
shorter parents or kids that are not even on the growth chart. Other questions? I've got one up here. Jamie gave me a couple. So, oh, so this is actually interesting. So if you have a child who has clear-cut anxiety and a child who has clear-cut ADHD and you decide this is getting in his or her way enough, I want medication. Well, what do you go for first? What do you do? Do you go with the ADHD med or do you go with the, with the anxiety med? I will tell you that um, by and large, based on experience, I tend to go ADHD first because often the anxiety winds itself down. And I've seen that time and time again. Nothing like a kid having confidence of being able to organize, study, put together a project, um, not be late and discombobulated and forgetting his backpack constantly. That's really good for decreasing anxiety. So I tend to go stimulant first. Unless there's overwhelming anxiety and the ADHD is not a big part of the puzzle, then I flip it and I'll start the anxiety drug, and that takes longer. Another reason to start stimulant. You know with the stimulant straight away how you're doing. When you put someone on an anti-anxiety drug, it doesn't even start working for two to four weeks, and it really isn't maxing out for three months. So those take time. So for those reasons, I tend to start ADHD first, anxiety second, with occasional exceptions. Yes? Yeah. I can't tell you how often that doesn't happen because it is a fear of many parents. But I have seen, particularly on Adderall, and I'm not picking on it, I use Adderall. I've had people say he's just not himself. The good news is it's not permanent. So again, it goes in the work or not, bug him or not category. It's as simple as that. And I say, is this something that you don't like? Do you want to give it a little longer? And if the answer is no and no, take him off. So, yeah, I've seen it, but I don't think it's very common. We'll go here and then there. Go ahead. How do you get kids to self-report? You know, yeah. I mean, I'm sure the older that they get, the better they do self-report. You know, yeah. if you're thinking about going to do this, like, do you teach them about neurodiversity? Do you I do. I do. And I, I base it on age and make it age appropriate. And I base it on my rough estimate of what they can handle IQ-wise, etc. But I get right down and I talk to them about these concepts. Uh, sort of a kid version of it. You gotta have in some degree kid buy-in. I mean, medicines wind up under the bed or, you know. So I just had a kid today uh, from Wilton with a whole lot of OCD and anxiety, et cetera, and she also has narcolepsy. That's another one that can kind of run with this. So she was on Provigil, which is a medicine that can keep her awake during the day. And the mom said, I don't think it's really working because she's coming home and just crashing for five hour naps. And the kid said, I took it once this week. <laughs> so you got to try to get kid buy-in. And sometimes they work with our psychologists and they go over why it's important. As a kid gets older, you make the case that, look, it's no longer about your parent. I don't really care what the parent says. This is about your life and how you want to live a better life. And try to make it worth their while. But it's not always easy. Yes? So because the increasingly we're treating addiction with looking for underlying emotional and Um, and because the youth brain almost can replicate trauma in terms of the anxiety and, and dopamine and everything that's going on and forming, and, and those pathways are, are very right to be <coughs> opening up for addiction. Are you seeing any issues where nicotine usage and addiction are contributing to um, diseases, treatments, um, anything in your work? Um, so that's a complicated question. Um, first, trauma, right? So trauma changes everything, um, just in general. The, you can't alter your genetics, right? Your eye color is your eye color. But you can alter your epigenetics, which is how you splice your genes and what proteins are made from them. And if someone has had trauma at a pivotal time in their life, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, neglect, etc., it alters the trajectory of their brain development. I mean, just and we've got that in a number of different conditions. Chronic pain syndromes, chronic anxiety and depression, all of that can be traced back to. And, and sometimes I'm the only doctor who asked about trauma. Um, the developing brain has a milieu that can look like that, I agree. Um, 
I'll tell you, uh, this whole jewel thing has been disastrous, right? I mean, I've got kids who have been pulled out of college and put in rehab for jewel of nicotine. We're not even talking about weed. Um, so, yeah, I think that stuff's really bad. Um, I will say, though, that the idea of drugs, right? So this is a stimulant. Stimulants, it's, it's a drug. And what about when a kid is a teenager? What about drug use? Um, there was an old study, probably debunked, that said kids with ADHD are more likely to gravitate to cocaine because they're treating their disorder. The fact is, in a much better NIH-sponsored study, kids who, are, who have ADHD and they take their stimulant drug are far less likely to abuse drugs and alcohol than an ADHD kid who's not on a stimulant drug. And the, the plain and simple reason is their impulsivity goes down. So there's a lot to unpack in your question, but those are just some points that come out, come to mind from that. Yes? You mentioned biofeedback in your practice. Yes. You use it to treat what conditions, and you don't use neurofeedback. So, so here's, OK, so the first part's easy. Biofeedback is um, a technique done properly, in my opinion, by a PhD psychologist trained in it, of which you take a biological parameter. Um, there's a bunch to use. Muscle contractility is one. The other one we use a lot is the temperature of one's finger. Um, the finger is not 98.6 thermometer under the tongue. It could be 79, it could be 84. That information goes into a computer software program. It's displayed on a big screen. And depending on the age of the kid or adult, you can alter the games. But basically, the child is taught um, in, in sort of a relaxation, meditative thing to increase blood flow to the limb which increases temperature, which changes the computer screen, and that is feedback on the brain, gets the brain to a lower or a more chill set point, right? So scientifically validated, you know, large studies at a Cincinnati Children's Hospital, anxiety can be treated with biofeedback, insomnia, it's a great treatment for insomnia, non-medical, um, and migraine. So child migraine has been absolutely proved to be responsive to biofeedback. Now, neurofeedback, neurofeedback has a lot to like about it, but it's just done so terribly around here. So what it is, is you hook up EEG electrodes, and you get this little color-coded picture of the brain, and, and there's different wavelengths of brain, and all that's legit. I mean, as all you're sitting here now, you have an alpha rhythm, eight hertz per second, oscillating in your brain. Unless someone back there is dozing off, they've got a theta. They slow down a little bit. Delta is your sleep waves, etc. So you can actually look at a brain and then teach them some feedback techniques to try to alter those patterns. However, it's become gimmicky, gimmicka-sized. Uh, chiropractors, social workers, people who do not have any advanced degree in neurophysiology are buying this to make money and they're ripping off parents. And they'll even say things, the parents will come to me and they say, look at my son's alpha delta ratio, my goodness how much better it is. And I say, well is he better? No, but look at this picture. <laughs> and it's pure nonsense. Um, so at a university setting, neurofeedback can be a useful tool. It just hasn't made it around here. So that's, that's my issue with neurofeedback. Other questions? Oh, I got a few here. I'll give you guys questions. Um, what about supplements like fish oil? Big fan. The literature is very weak. So do we have studies that I can quote saying that fish oil is good for you? We don't. Um, other than burping. Uh, I think that it's pretty well tolerated. I'd rather get things into diet whenever possible as opposed to supplements. So if you eat salmon, if you eat avocado, right? Um, in our Alzheimer's patients, we have them take a teaspoon of um, pure extra virgin coconut oil twice a day because those medium chain fatty acids are really good for the brain. That's why ketogenic diet can help conditions like epilepsy, maybe autism, maybe not. Um, because you get into a ketotic state and you're feeding your brain fats. So I'm fine with it. Do you ever do testing that looks at a child's microbiome or look at mitochondrial dysfunction? So again, if you like science, it's not there yet, but I've become fascinated with the gut microbiome and I think there's a lot of legitimacy there. 
We just haven't gotten there yet. Um, Parkinson's, they have an altered gut microbiome. People who have bleeds in their brain, there's something that the gut microbiome does that produces this elastin material that makes those blood vessels weak. I mean, it's fascinating, right? There's a trillion of them, the bugs in our gut. They need us, we need them. And we used to just look at them under a microscope and say, you're the purple colored ones, you're the red colored ones. But now we've got genetics of microbiome um, and we know that it's even more accurate identifier of who you are than your fingerprint. So all that said, and there's a lot of like basic knowledge that's been done yet, and how does it translate? We have no bloody idea. Unless you have C. diff and you go on probiotics. We don't even know if probiotics work outside of C. diff, if you want to be completely honest about it. So I was talking to one of the world's authorities on the gut microbiome, who's an um, autoimmune specialist at Dartmouth. And he's telling me fascinating stuff, giving me just facts that were blowing me away. And I said, okay, so now what do we do about it? And he said, green leafy vegetables? I mean, so... <laughs> It's probably real, but we're not really there yet. Interestingly, one of our migraine drugs is a nasal spray working on the nose microbiome and changing the ratio of bugs in your nose and decreasing your migraines. It's all natural. So I think there's something that's going to come of that. Mitochondrial, the mitochondrial DNA is separate from our regular DNA. It's inherited maternally. The idea with mitochondrial disorders in the muscle, in the brain, in the eyes, etc. It doesn't have too much overlap with the standard conditions I talked about, unless there's something else. Unless there's ataxia plus a spectrum disorder, or weakness, I mean, frank weakness um, and anxiety, or something like that. Then I'll think about mitochondrial disorders. Uh, but I do. I like to test minimally, um, and only use the, things that, the tests that I think are appropriate. Can college students drink on anti-anxiety meds? Strongly encouraged. No, it's, it's, it's fine. I mean, even adults who wind up not being big drinkers do drink the most in college. Uh, binge drinking, awful. If you could ever get a kid to sip a glass of wine at night, but they'll, they'll never do that. I've got kids in college. Um, the good news is you can drink on Prozac, you can drink on Zoloft. If you're on a sedative medicine, then you've got to be careful. So if, you're, if the child is given clonazepam or Xanax or Ativan, um, don't tell this to them, but between us, if they had a drink or two on those drugs, they would be fine. It really takes a lot of drinks and a lot of Xanax, but then you're looking at serious trouble, right? So that's the one I'd be careful of, and I tell them about that. The, the biggest, and, and Xanax is really popular. If you listen to your kids' rap songs, Xans are all over the place. It's a street drug with a value. Um, ADHD drugs are all over the place in college. I can't tell you how often I have a college student who wants ADHD meds, and I say to them, so which one did you try? And they go, oh, I tried Adderall from my friend, I tried Concerta from the guy down the, the, you know, the hall of my dorm. So I say to kids, you know, if you take them to college, and they're very helpful in college, uh, don't tell anybody. Tell them you're taking a vitamin. Keep it locked up. I mean, because kids will break into your room for these drugs. So. Um, what, does it, what does it cost for testing of what? The gene testing, the neuropsych testing? The, the neuropsych testing? So again, I sound like a cynic, and I don't mean to be, um, but there are people who will rip you off and charge you six or $9,000 for neuropsych testing, and that's nonsense. Um, a good neuropsych testing for a specific question or two, anxiety, ADHD, for $1,500, $2,000. Um, if there's encephalopathy, if there's a quote-unquote medical condition, again, this stupid distinction of psychiatric and medical, insurance can cover it. I've gotten that before. Um, what I sometimes ask our psychologists is, this kid's pretty normal, the family's pretty normal. Do a screen, do some limited neuropsych test, let me know the degree of anxiety and ADHD. And that shouldn't be very expensive. Can you take school evaluations, the, which are getting better all the time, I believe, that you know, like that and take a bit, I'm seeing a hole here. Like yeah, so it's just, so I like, I mean, I really love neuropsych testing, but I'm not wedded to them. In fact, occasionally, um, occasionally we'll just wing it. And that's not bad medicine in the right situation. If you're in a crisis situation and you gotta do something, 
I know these drugs are safe. I've been trying to make the case of that tonight. And sometimes I say, you know, I love the science and we're going to get this eventually, but right now, we're going to try them on this if you want. And the mom goes, oh, thank God. You know, so I'm not wedded to these, but they're really helpful for me in the long run. How much is the swab one? Well, so that's variable. Some insurances, it's 50 bucks, and sometimes it's thousands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you prefer to use that though? Is that your first swab? Do I, yeah, I mean, I think... Again, if you think of it as somewhat 70, 80% accurate in most kids most of the time, I think that's the way to look at it. To look and say, well, he's got to have this one, he can't have this middle category one. I'm not sure that that's really proved yet. I think that's all the questions. Um, holiday, summer, uh, insurance coverage. Does Husky cover it? I don't know. Um, I see Husky kids, but... I don't take insurance in my practice anyway. How long do you advise therapy for anxiety before thinking about medicine? Six to 12 sessions. It's not that long. Um, what happens is the kid should be able to do this stuff him or herself. The parents can help them. So this is not Woody Allen 20 year psychoanalysis. This should be practical. All right, one more, yes. So one of the stimulants was changed, you said, or just it went from a different generic? Yeah, it went like, from a tablet to a tool. Okay. So the problem with medicines, it could be that, um, and we find this sometimes even when there's not such a big change, fluoxetine, the oldest drug, right, that Prozac, that changed the way we treat anti-anxiety, anti-depression, it went generic ages ago. And I think there's 21 companies making fluoxetine. And the FDA says these companies have to be somewhere between, I think it's 80% and 110% of what the branded product is. So therefore, most people can take generics most of the time and not notice too much difference. But if you get a drug that's only 80% of what you were taken, you're going to notice you're not doing as well. Or if you were near toxicity, not dangerous toxicity, but side effect toxicity, and now you got one that was 110%, you're going to feel dizzy or off or something like that. So I find if you have a drug that works and you try to stick to that brand of generic, and it might be that, I mean, that's that's common actually. So, all right. So we're gonna pack it up now. But thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. <laughs>